What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you a review of Tyranny, Obsidian's lesser known CRPG that released a little after the first Pillars of Eternity to not much applause really. Given Obsidian's recent surge, let's say, in popularity, I figured I would share with you guys one of actually my favorite games that Obsidian's released. It's really good. But my personal opinion aside, this is a review. So before we get into the actual game itself, let's talk a little bit about the history of it. So obviously everyone knows Obsidian made Pillars of Eternity. Um, they got it done through Kickstarter. That's how they raised the money for it. And then that game went on to be very successful. The money that they earned from Pillars of Eternity, they actually then invested in making the game Tyranny. Now Tyranny is made in the same engine, Unity, a modified version of the Unity engine, mind you. During the production of Pillars of Eternity, a lot of the problems they had with that engine were actually hammered out. So in Tyranny, it was actually a very smooth development process, and it really shows in game, mind you, because all of those changes to the engine had already been made for Pillars of Eternity, and they kind of smoothed all the rough edges out of it, so to speak. Tyranny was published by Paradox Interactive, and according to Paradox, it technically underperformed. Like, honestly, the poll I made about this review, like half of the people didn't even know what game Tyranny was. There was a leak on Steam's analytics that apparently they say the game sold around 525,000 copies initially, which to me, it's hard to hear that number and then be like, it underperformed, but you know, whatever. Technically, it didn't meet their sales expectations, so there you go. And Tyranny was built off of ideas of games Obsidian had already been thinking about. Dating all the way back to as far as 2007, Obsidian had been pitching ideas similar to Tyranny, and when they finally got to make the game that Tyranny became, they took a lot of the concepts from those pitches, again, as far back as 2007, and kind of combined them into what, again, Tyranny then became. So Tyranny is, of course, a CRPG, which is kind of your top-down, isometric view, classic party management game. Now, the world of Tyranny is probably the best part of the game. The world building in Tyranny, as well as their evaluation of what real evil is, is really intense. Like, so a lot of games, like, the villain is so over the top, or it's so dramatic, it's in a way kind of removed from reality. So for Tyranny, despite being this high fantasy setting, for me what really struck out is uh, the storytelling just nailed the real gray area of what evil is really supposed to be. Because even if you do the right thing, it might still come out in poor consequences later. And the choices in this game are huge and they matter. There are very few choices in this game that do not have a sincere impact on what is happening around you. But to give you guys some preface, you actually know what the world of Tyranny is like. The world itself is called Teratus, or Teratus, however you want to pronounce it. Over the course of the last 400 years, an entity known as Kairos has been dominating the land through armies. He has been... He, she, by the way, whatever, we'll get into that in a minute. Has been slowly sweeping across the land over 400 years. And the only place left to conquer is a place called the Tears, which is kind of the southwestern portion of Teratus. Kairos, as I vaguely alluded to there, is, it's not known much about who or what Kairos is. People don't know if it's a male, if it's a female, if it's a group of people. Is it a council? Like, honestly, no one knows. They're that far removed. There are hints about it, and those hints are deliberately vague. Even people who have supposedly met Kairos are deliberately vague about it. You'll hear him or she referred to as literally both genders throughout the game on and off, and it is very much so intentional. They don't want you to know. The game starts out as you being a fate binder of the Archon of Justice, Tunon the Adjudicator. So, what an Archon is, are beings who generate magic in some unique way. So in Teratus, most magic is generated through magic sigils that you, you know then draw, and then you can cast them through those sigils, and that's how magic is produced in this world. However, Archons have a sort of natural magic to them. They just naturally produce some unique form of magic. They don't have to do anything special half the time, it just happens in most cases. Archons usually start out as what are called exarchs. Exarchs are just people with unique gift. It's not even necessarily magical in nature. But those exarchs, through their deeds, slowly sway people either to their side or make people fear them. And then it is hinted at that that is the transition from an exarch to an archon. That once enough people either fear or love this person, it turns that unique gift from just like 
a gift to a genuine magical power. And that turns them into an Archon. Now, Archon powers are genuinely unique and they're really cool. So the Archons that the game focuses on are Tunon. Tunon is the Archon of Justice or Kairos' Law, basically. And his power is probably the most deliberately vague, but he's very good at twisting the law to favor Kairos and basically every situation. And as a fate binder, which is what your character is, you serve Tunon directly as an agent of the court, and you help with that through various means. Now, character creation, you kind of build your own backstory. Regardless of that backstory, you get sent to help with the conquest in the tiers as part of Tunon, the adjudicator, who answers to Kairos's forces. Those forces being the disfavored, which are a very uh, well-disciplined army under the leadership of the Archon of War, Graven Ash. Now, Graven Ash power is, as the disfavored like to say, Ash protects. So, Graven Ash has the ability to put a shield of sorts over his people that you can't actually see, but it protects them from wounds. Wounds that might kill a normal person will hit a disfavored soldier and just not do anything and he can do that with like literally everyone in his army and through that connection he can literally feel every single one of their lives so in addition to the disfavored also sent to the tears was a second army known as the scarlet chorus they answer to the voices of narat the archon of secrets his his literal name is the voices of narat so he is harder to define because he is not one entity so much as many the archon of secrets uh, absorbs people (laughs) into himself and gains all of their knowledge, and thus their secrets, and that's kind of how that works. Now, the Scarlet Chorus is barbaric in comparison to the Disfavored's incredibly rigid militaristic style. The Scarlet Chorus are barbaric. They will conquer a place, and the survivors are basically told, join the Chorus or die. All of that out of the way, you are sent as a Fate Binder with the Scarlet Chorus and the Disfavored to the Tears to help conquer it. Now, character creation, which is kind of where we start at with character creation, we get to uh, pick a backstory after we make, of course, our physical appearance. Um, We can pick a history, which uh, is pretty cool. It gives you uh, starting dialogue options as well as starting skills. So you can be a war mage, right? And that'll uh, give you a, a couple points in certain skills. And then it'll also give you dialogue options throughout the game attributed to being a war mage. Now, the skill bonuses are not super important. Like, they'll help you get started, but, like, they're not going to make a huge in- impact on the game. Even, like, Path of the Damned, it's not that big of a deal. And then you pick your expertise. So this is kind of important. Now, when you actually get into the game, there's going to be six skill trees. And when you're picking the expertise part of character creation, you get to pick two. You can actually double up on the same one if you want. But basically what this does is it gives you a talent point in one of those six trees, depending on which expertise you pick, as well as determining your starting equipment a little bit. Now, attributes, pretty standard stuff for character creation and, you know, CRPGs in general. Might gives you uh, extra ability strength. Intellect gives you, you know, more spells and better spell strength. So, you know, pretty much your standard stuff as far as attributes go. Pretty easy to figure out. And then that brings us to our skills, which are broken down from attack, which is broken down into weapon and magic, and then support skills. So attacks are probably the most important because we get to make our own class. So in this particular game, Tyranny, you don't actually pick a class. You level by doing, very similar to Skyrim system, actually. Say you use a magic staff. Let's say that you went all shock spells and you're using a shock magic staff. The more you use that staff, the more you're going to level up your control lightning because you're using uh, a lightning staff as well as your magic staff skill because you're using a magic staff. And the more you use that, the more you're going to level those up, which is going to give your character experience towards their next level. It's basically Skyrim's system of level by doing, but in CRPG form, it works really well and allows you to switch what your character's doing throughout the game, so that's pretty cool. Now, support skills are a little different. They simultaneously affect combat and the rest of the world. So, athletics, for instance, is what you'll engage with when you need to, like, climb a wall or push a rock out of your way, that kind of stuff. But it will, of course, also affect some skills in a minor way. And then things like uh, lore, for instance. Lore is the magic version of athletics. Lore will allow you to learn higher level spells with the more lore you have, the higher your lore skill is. And then it will also add damage to your spells through the calculations that if you mouse over it, it will actually tell you the calculations and how they're made. 
but lore will also add damage to your attacks with magic, that kind of stuff. Okay, so after we make our character in what is one of the coolest starting systems I think I've ever seen, um, you actually start the game by engaging with random encounters almost in a way. So CRPGs have this thing they where you know you move around the main game world if you're unaware. And then as you're traveling, random encounters will happen sort of like in Dungeons and Dragons. And then what you're actually doing is traveling between hub areas where you're actually playing the game. And then when those random encounters happen, you know, it is just that, a random encounter. Right after you make your character, you get to play a little game that is called the Conquest. So when you first get sent to the tiers by Kairos and the two armies of the Disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus, you, through these random encounters and decision making, actually can determine how that conquest actually goes. Now, it is guided you can uh, come to a few different outcomes you can go through the entire conquest and make individualized decisions or you can skip it and choose one of the three main paths that the conquest allows you to do anyway which is to favor the disfavored favor the scarlet chorus or take a neutral path of course running through the conquest yourself and kind of playing around with those random encounters and decisions will help you come to a unique uh, game world instead of just picking one of the pre-made ones through the you know pick a an option option so this is important because what you choose in the conquest will actually affect the game world so for instance there is a town called lethian's crossing depending on what you did during the conquest it is possible for like different people to be in control of lethian's crossing and depending on which one of them is in control of the town, it will also determine what is available in the town for you when you get there. So lots of stuff like that, which is where I want to preface the game by saying that decisions in this game matter, as I mentioned earlier. There's not a way to undo a lot of the decisions you're going to make. A lot of them are permanent and they do have consequences. If you choose to attack somebody in dialogue because that comes up as an option, it's going to have ramifications. Choice and consequence are a huge part of this game and they do it incredibly well. Now, after this conquest happens, uh, some time goes by and ultimately a rebellion picks up from the conquered people of the Tears, specifically in the area known as Vindrian's Well. The Disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus have been trying to put down this uh, rebellion and have uh, not been doing well. So, you get sent as a fate minder to declare an edict of Kairos, which I haven't mentioned up to this point. But you might be wondering, how is it that Kairos has been able to, over 400 years, conquer the entire known world, as well as, you know, keep all of those people together? Well, the answer is edicts. The reason people are so terribly frightened of Kairos is that Kairos is the only known being capable of making what are called edicts which are basically spells that he puts on paper, and when they are read aloud, they have devastating effects on the entire world that are permanent until someone solves the edict. So for the one at the beginning of the game here, it's called the Edict of Swords. And basically, if the Disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus don't manage to conquer Vindrian's Well by a certain date, everyone in the valley dies. So basically, you have to either capture Vindrian's well for one of the armies or yourself or whatever in the name of Kairos before a certain date in game or everyone dies. It's a little over a week, I think, in game and you actually do, like, that's a real time limit, by the way. That's act one is conquering this area with these armies before everyone dies. In addition to this, uh, edicts were cast throughout the conquest part of the game, which really shows the power of Kairos and why people basically just admit that he's got the right to rule. So Kairos, just in the tiers alone, casts an Edict of Fire, which basically turns an entire section of the tiers into a volcano and is constantly killing people there in order to destroy a library. And once that library is destroyed, the Edict is supposed to resolve. There is another one called the Edict of Stone, which he actually cast on a traitor Archon, the Archon of Stone, Cairn. He betrayed Kairos in the middle of the conquest, and as a reprisal, Kairos issued the Edict of Stone, which basically petrified Cairn and is slowly killing him. <laughs> These edicts have insane power. So the Edict of Stone, for instance, in addition to petrifying Cairn, it basically destroyed an entire section of the tears by making it a craggy, impossible to navigate terrain that is literally falling apart under your feet. 
Bringing us back to Act 1, we've been chosen to issue the Edict of Swords to the armies of Kairos and basically tell them to put down this rebellion and actually formally capture the damn tears and stop dicking around, basically. So we do that, and along the way, you can side with the disfavored, you can side with the chorus, you can side with the rebels in the name of Kairos. Like, you can unite them and be like, all right, we're doing this now. And then there is also an anarchist option where when you get to the well, you can actually choose to just, you know, fight the people who helped you there and claim the entire area as your own. You can even do that instead of letting one of the armies conquer it. And this is important because this is what kicks off the paths of the game. So there's the disfavored path, the Scarlet Chorus path, the anarchist path, which is going by yourself. That's the uh, betray everyone kind of thing. And then there's the rebel path where you actually unite the people of the tiers together. Now, this is important because it will actually determine how you move through the game, which brings me to another point. The enemies of each area are scaled depending on which path you took. So depending on which path you took, say, you know, say you picked the disfavored. If you pick the disfavored, you're going to a place called Sentinel Stand first. The enemies there will then be scaled to be appropriate to, you know, you just starting Act 2 as opposed to ending Act 2. So just keep in mind, in addition to, like, you know, role-playing options, picking a path throughout the game, like, also kind of literally is a path through the game and does affect when you go certain areas. Now, when you capture Vendrian's Well, you come in contact with a spire of the old walls. The old walls are structures that predate basically everything, and al dotted along them are these giant spires. No one knows how they got there, nobody knows who built them, anything like that. Well, when you conquer Vendrian's Well and break the Edict of Swords that Kairos cast so that nobody dies, you seem to absorb some sort of power from it. And in absorbing that power, you activate some power in the spire and you get teleported to the top of it and the spire reacts to your power in some way that you're unaware of. And obviously everyone, including your master, Tune on the Adjudicator, take notice of this because it's uh, unusual, shall we say. That's how the game starts. I don't want to spoil any more of the story because it's an amazing story with a ton of world building. That's all I want to say on it. But basically that's what you're kind of doing. You're going through the game, trying to find more of these spires throughout the tiers and kind of discover what that mystery is there as well as decide what you want to do with Kairos, because Kairos, for all intensive purposes, is an, is an enemy conquering army who's conquering the tiers for no other reason than to make it part of his empire. So you can choose to, you know, unite the tiers under a banner and then fight Kairos even. You can choose to obey Kairos at every turn throughout the game, including the laws. So working for the Archon of Justice, there are literal laws that Kairos has made. And throughout the game, you'll be presented with, well, do I break these laws in order to get the job done? Or do I follow them to the letter? Stuff like that. It's really cool. So that's kind of where I'm going to leave the description of the story. I don't want to spoil too much in case anybody does decide to pick this up. So from here, I want to talk about the combat a little bit. It is real time with pause, which is pretty standard stuff. If you are used to CRPGs, it's pretty much real time with pause or turn based. So with this, it is real time with pause and it is very good. So it's a very robust system. There is a huge, crazy, in-depth magic system. The magic system does tend to dominate the later difficulties, like in the hard versions of the game or the Path of the Damned difficulty. You pretty much have to use magic and be a mage. That said, there are combos abilities with your companions. So throughout the game, you're going to pick up like four or five companions that are kind of each allied with one of the different factions you come encounter with. And depending on which allies you have with you, you'll get access to different combo abilities that you and that character can use together to affect combat, which I thought was a really nice touch. There are tons of abilities to choose from. You personally get six different skill trees, whereas your allies only get like two or three to choose from, which helps managing them be a little easier, to be honest. They get unique skill trees tailored to them, whereas your character gets kind of six generic ones that you're gonna get regardless of who or what kind of character you make. The magic system in this game is amazing and is one of the absolute best parts of the game. So the magic system is a spell creation system that is also heavily guided. Now you're not gonna be able to make a spell that the game doesn't already know you can make. And because it has that limit to it, the spell creation system is amazing because it's simultaneously freeform, but heavily tailored. So the way it works is in order to use spells, even as a mage, 
you have to learn and find sigils because as I mentioned earlier, all magic in this world, normal magic that is, is used through sigils. Now, you're gonna pick up core sigils, expression sigils, and accent sigils. Core sigils are basically the type of magic you're going to use. Uh, think fire, ice, um, illusion, that kind of stuff. Are you uh, affecting people's emotions? Emotion is a core sigil. There's another one called uh, grave light or teratus or something, which is like draining. And then there's the expression sigils. Expression sigils choose the shape of the magic you are using. So there is like distant impact. There is like a wall expression. There is a cone expression, there's an area of effect expression, there's an aura expression, there is a material weapon expression. So you choose a core, you choose the expression, which determines basically what the spell is gonna be. So if you choose fire material force, you're going to be casting fire damage on your weapon, whereas if you choose fire distant impact, you're gonna make like a fireball spell. And then from there is where it gets really fun with the accent sigils. The accent sigils are all sorts of stuff that enhance the spell. There's everything from cooldown reduction to hitting multiple targets to unique accent sigils that change the nature of the way the spell works entirely. Does it even cast on you maybe instead of an enemy, that kind of stuff. The accents are all over the place and they do all sorts of stuff. Now, each and every single sigil has a lore cost. Lore is one of the support skills I mentioned earlier. So the way it works with the magic system is that in order to learn more spells with more accents, you have to have a higher lore. Each core sigil has a lore requirement to use the base version of it with any expression sigil. Now, in order to make a spell, you have to use a core and an expression, and then the accents are all optional. Accent sigils are all you. So the higher lore skill you get, the more accents uh, you can put on a spell and thus make it more powerful. So what might start out as a regular fireball at the beginning of the game might turn into, if you are you know, using it a lot, a fireball that bounces between enemies, has a shorter cooldown and a longer range, and does more damage. So stuff like that. It's amazing. I can't express how much I love the magic system of this game. It's so good. Now, I do want to talk uh, about the difficulty a little bit. Path of the Damned in Tyranny is hard. It is the highest difficulty setting, and oh my god, the first act in this, uh, in this mode is just so difficult. It took me forever to get out of Act 1. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't keep that difficulty, because as you start learning higher level spells, that difficulty does fall off in the later acts, but the last fight of Act 1 for my Path of the Damned playthrough, easily probably some of the most trouble I've had with a game in a very long time. Before we wrap this up, I'm going to tell you about some of the things I don't like about the game. So the balance struggles I just mentioned with Path of the Damned, well that actually not only hits the actual difficulty settings of the game, it also affects the gameplay itself, right? So as I kind of mentioned, Path of the Damned basically requires you to play a mage. Like you're just not going to get through it with a melee character because melee characters simply do not have the options that mages do. And even if you do use a melee character, you're going to have to so heavily augment it with magic and the lore skill that's basically a mage anyway, even if you're using swords at that point. So Path of the Damned really kind of feels like it shoehorns you into builds because you just have to in order to actually do any damage to anything. In addition to this, uh, pathing can be terrible throughout the game. Like your companions will get stuck on shit all the time. It gets annoying and tedious to move them. Like it's not a game breaking thing by any means. More often than not, it's you just like having to manually physically direct them somewhere and it's annoying. In addition to this, like a ton of CRPGs, the inventory system is god awful. They just kind of throw everything into one pane. You can sort it, which is fine, but you keep getting so much junk and the icons are so small that it is difficult to manage. And I'm a super, I'm like a super organized person. So if I'm being annoyed by an inventory, I know it's gonna annoy other people. That said, I think that's kind of going to wrap up this review of Tyranny, Obsidian's lesser known CRPG that is all about choice and consequence and the permutations of evil. Personally, I recommend the game. It's 30 bucks on Steam 
and for that it's such an amazing story it comes with a couple dlcs now i think it's tales of the tears and bastard wounds which uh bastard's wound which fleshes out the game a little more as well but it is a very good game if you're a fan of crpgs i think you'll love this even if you've never heard of it you should definitely give it a shot the world building and the story are top tier there you go guys i hope you enjoyed the video if you watched it all the way through thank you so much the youtube algorithm really appreciates that but may you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.